All right. Good evening, everyone, and good morning uh, to those of you who are joining in from the US. My name is Rajiv Jairaman. I am the founder and CEO of Nolscape. Uh, we are an exciting experiential learning platform, and we focus on a couple of solution areas, leading now and leading next. And speaking about leadership in today's context, one of the, the biggest challenges in front of leaders is not just to navigate the crisis uh, environment that we are living in today, but also to ensure the health, well-being and the happiness of people in the workplace is also uh, taken care of, right? And that's a tall order. How does a leader do this? How do you ensure happiness at workplace during a time of crisis? That's exactly the question that uh, we'll be answering today uh, in today's webinar, and we couldn't have asked for a better person to um, help us get our head around this. We have uh, Professor Raj Raghunathan. He is uh, the uh, Professor um, Zale Centennial Prof of Business at uh, McCombs uh, School of Business. He's interested in exploring how people's judgments and decisions impact their happiness and fulfillment. You may know this when you look him up online. His six week long course on Coursera on happiness currently has 250,000 students. Uh, let me restate that for dramatic effect. That's quarter of a million students online and was voted for as a top MOOC in 2015, 16 and 17 and as one of the top 50 MOOCs of all time. So it is indeed a privilege and pleasure to have Raj with us. Uh, Raj is also a, an author of the book. Uh, uh, if you're so smart, why aren't you happy? Right, um, so that's uh, an exciting book. You should pick it up. And he has recently launched a course called uh, Happier Employees and Return on Investment. And I'm sure as we apply happiness in the workplace, this is a question that um, will need uh, some answers. Do happier employees lead to better ROI, right? Uh, so before I hand this over to Professor Raj, I just wanted to um, shine in his glory a little bit, shine in his light a little bit. So I have a few things in common with him. One is uh, many years ago, I did do a TEDx talk on uh, the pursuit of happiness. I've been a student of this topic uh, ever since, and uh, I've been learning a lot from what Professor Raj has been uh, uh, talking about and he's publishing. So been an ardent um, you know, follower of his work. So that's one second is both of us went to Bits Pilani for our undergrad. Um, and, and I'm happy to let you know that we are collaborating now. We'll be ha uh, launching a simulation on happiness at the workplace along with Professor Raj. Um, so he will first present his ideas to us and then we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions on uh, the chat window. Awesome to have you here, uh, Professor Raj. Please take it away from you. Thank you very much, uh, Rajiv. That was a very uh, glowing um, and I feel somewhat undeserved for such a great uh, introduction. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm really, really happy to be here and uh, very happy to present on this topic. So um, I'm going to jump straight in and I'm going to take about 10, maybe 15 minutes to talk a little bit about uh, some of the background to this topic. And then uh, I'm going to show you a little bit uh, of the simulation that I'm collaborating with uh, Nolescape on. And then after that, we'll, we'll shift to the Q&A. So um, this topic of happiness uh, in the workplace uh, might seem like a somewhat frivolous topic. Uh, when I used to um, first teach this class on happiness at the University of Texas at Austin, I also visit at the Indian School of Business. Uh, many people used to come to me and say, what happiness in the business school? You know, aren't they the opposite? You know, in business, we are not supposed to be happy. We are supposed to be driven and achievement oriented and somewhat stressed out so that we can be more productive uh, and make money and achieve things and, uh, you know, uh, rise up the corporate ladder. So it seems a little incongruous to have happiness um, as, a, as a topic of study in a business school. Uh, this was about 10 years back. And uh, in the last 10 years especially, but even before that, a lot of evidence has started, had started gathering that happiness uh, is not really a luxury in the business context. Um, not just because everybody wants to be happy, right? So all human beings, all living things you could say want to be happy. And so why should business people and business uh, communities be excluded from it? But also because of something called, that might be called functionality of happiness. So I'm gonna start with that topic and, and what functionality of happiness means really is um, that happiness is not just a feel good emotion. It's also useful to be happy 
for uh, relatively functional reasons. It uh, leads to greater productivity uh, and profits. Okay, so on the next slide, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you uh, three different ways in which happiness can be functional. So on the top, you see this picture of the heart lifting up um, uh, a bar, um, and uh, that's supposed to represent this idea that happier people are healthier. Happier people are healthier. Um, so bottom line, happier people live longer. And there was a study done with nuns where they separated the nuns into the happy nuns, the medium happy nuns, and the unhappy nuns based off of uh, what they wrote in a journal when they joined the monastery. And then they examined how long these nuns ended up living. And it turned out that happiness had a whopping effect. The unhappy nuns on average lived 11 years less than the happy nuns. OK, and you might ask yourself, OK, that's a study with nuns. I'm not a nun. I'm the opposite of a nun. Um, how much does that, that those findings apply to me? Uh, but the interesting thing about that study is that um, the only thing that varied among these nuns really was their happiness levels. So they lived in the same environment. They were exposed to the same set of stimuli. Uh, they ate the same food. They breathed the same kind of air, et cetera. And so the one thing that did vary was their happiness levels, and it turned out that it had a big effect, as I mentioned. So other studies have replicated that finding. If you're happier, you're less likely to suffer from uh, cardiovascular diseases. If you're happier, you're likely to have a better functioning immune system. Uh, right now, there are studies uh, being done on COVID-19 and recovery from COVID-19, and uh, some of these studies are looking at the happiness levels of these patients. And I'm really excited to see what the results are. I wouldn't at all be surprised. In fact, I predicted that the happier people uh, are more likely to survive and more likely to recover faster as well. Happier people have better functioning uh, respiratory systems. OK, so that's why happier people end up living longer. And in a business context, this is uh, relevant because what it means is that if you have happy employees working for you, chances are higher that they're going to show up for work more often. In fact, there was a study done on this topic, and what they found is that happier employees on, on average show up for work 16 more days in a year. 16 more days in a year, which is quite a significant amount. If you look at the US, you get two weeks of vacation every year, which is about 10 days off, right? If you're unhappy, you're going to take another one and a half times that to be absent from work, you know, 10 working days for vacation and then another 16 days uh, because you're, um, you're, you're sick, really, okay? Um, so it's a big, big effect. A second big way in which happiness is um, functional is that happier people are more collegial. And that's that picture on the lower right hand uh, corner on your screen. Uh, happier people are better in teams. Uh, they're more cooperative. They're more uplifting. They can see the lighter side of things. So when you know things go bad, as they inevitably do, right? In any organization, you're going to have challenges. Uh, you want to have happier people around you because they're more optimistic, they're more resilient, and they support you better and so on. OK, and so bottom line there is that happier teams outperform less happy teams. Happier teams outperform less happy teams, particularly in the long run. So uh, if you look at teams in which people seem um, more friendly to each other and um, you know are, are engaging in banter, playful banter, uh, they can go out and grab a drink in the evening as opposed to everyone's basically like hasta la vista. You know, at the end of the evening, they just go back to uh, back to their homes and that's where they have their friends and they rarely ever hobnob and hang out with their, their um, colleagues, um, you'll see that happier teams over, especially over the long run, you know, six, five, um, you know, five, six uh, months down the road, eight months, especially two, three years down the road, uh, they tend to outperform the less happy teams. Um, the last way in which I want to talk a little bit about uh, that happiness is functional is on the lower left-hand corner. Uh, it turns out that um, happier people, just individually not working in teams, individually, uh, their brains function better. If you look at a happy brain under the fMRI machine, you'll see that all parts of the brain are kind of lit up, so to speak, okay? So are, are active. Oxygen is present in all parts of the brain. That means that blood is flowing to all parts of the brain. So in a, almost like in a, a literal sense, happier people are able to draw from all their past experiences, all the information that they have, uh, to inform a decision that they're about to make. Uh, if you contrast that with a stressed out, unhappy, anxious brain, only what's called the limbic system, um, the part of the brain that we borrowed from our reptilian ancestors, that part of the brain is 
active. And that part of the brain is very good at making fight or flight decisions, black or white decisions. But if you are making decisions, as I'm sure you are, which is which are more complex, which have to do with understanding human emotions and seeing the right thing at the right time, they call for an element of subtlety, right? Uh, an element of nuance. Uh, in those kinds of contexts, you're much better off being a happier person. Okay, if you're in the military and your job is to kind of guard your village against uh, a marauding opposing village, then perhaps anxiety is better. Okay, then you need to pull an all-nighter out and uh, the adrenaline that the anxiety and the stress pump into your system will help you kind of cope with that uh, and do better in that kind of a job. But as soon as your job calls for something more than just elementary level of mental processes, um, and it's not a menial job anymore, it's not about, you know, laying bricks, it's not about thumping uh, nail into wood, um, you're much better off being a happier person. And there's a lot of research behind it. And there's also a deeper understanding we have now for why happier people are more creative, more objective, and better decision makers. Uh, it's partly because of something called broaden and build, and or broadening and building. Basically, when you're a happier person, you're more stimulation seeking, you're more willing to expose yourself to new stimuli, try on a new product, uh, and um, more, more curious about the world. And so uh, as a result, if you've been happy for a long period of time, you're likely to have been exposed to more things in your life. You're likely to have learned more, okay? And uh, you know you can then use those learnings uh, to address a particular problem, um, which you may not have been able to do had you been unhappy and anxious and closed in, and therefore not as uh, willing to uh, learn about new topics and be curious about new topics, okay? So if you put all of this together, happier people are more um, healthy, they show up for work more, they're better in teams, they're more creative, they're more objective, they make better decisions, you would ex expect that happier people earn more money, which is in fact true. So lots of studies have shown uh, around the world uh, that happier people end up making more money. And in a, in a sense, that's really the most uh, convincing evidence you need that happiness um, leads to more productivity because uh, organizations, for the most part, uh, work in a way in which um, they uh, are incentivized to uh, pay sal higher salaries to people who are more productive, right? So if you're not um, being more productive, they're not going to pay. They're not stupid to give you more money just because you smile, right? And, and are happy. And, and so that's what we find that happier people, uh, on average, the happiest 20% on average earn 32% more salary than the least happy 20%. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this because you know, again, uh, there's a there's a misconception that happiness doesn't belong in the organizational space. You know, uh, that happiness is uh, reserved for your personal life. Okay, you can go ahead and be happy outside of nine to five, but when you come into work, you need to be serious, okay? Uh, and so the idea here is that happiness doesn't mean that you're, you're being frivolous, you're not taking things seriously. It just means that you have the buffer, you have the emotional bank, so to speak, uh, money in the emotional bank for you to be able to spend on situations that are challenging, okay? That, that um, your back is to the wall. That's when you can dig a little bit deeper if you're already coming from a happy space rather than when already, you know, you're, you're feeling... Uh, below that point of neutrality. If already you're feeling stressed out and anxious when you come into work because you have personal life problems or health problems, chances are you're not going to be able to cope as well with the stress of uh, the, the work-related stress. Okay, so that's one thing that I wanted to say. I want to move on to the next slide now, um, and I want to talk a little bit about, okay, so this this idea. Uh, so on, on the previous slide, you might have seen on the, the very bottom, it says 9%. So basically the idea is that this, is, um, this figure is from a meta-analysis that was done. Uh, across uh, more than 50 studies, uh, where, which all looked at the relationship between happiness of employees and productivity and profits. And what they found is that a, um, a one point increase in happiness on a seven point scale uh, produces a 9% increase in your profits as an organization across many different organizations, many different firms, okay? Um, so I wanted to point out that it's not just at the individual level, but also at the organizational level that you see this increase. Okay, so on the next slide and the one after it, there's actually two embedded videos, uh, and I wanted to play these videos to you guys. And this gentleman you see on the screen, his name is, hang on uh, before you play it. Um, this gentleman you see on the screen is uh, uh, Sean Acor. Uh, he's a consultant, a happiness consultant, and he's got a book out I really recommend it. It's called The Happiness Advantage. So what are the ways in which happiness confers an advantage to you? And he's going to summarize some of the results that he's found on, uh, on, on the effects of happiness on productivity. Okay, so play it. It doesn't seem to be working. 
Yes, Professor. Okay. All right. So um, in, in the video, basically, uh, Sean Acor summarizes some of the top line findings uh, from his research and other people's research on the uh, beneficial effects of uh, happiness. And hopefully, you know, we'll be able to share this uh, slide deck with you and then you can play it and uh, you won't have volume problems on your side. But uh, and I don't remember the exact numbers, you know, which is part of the reason why I embedded this video. But um, basically, he talks about how happier employees or organizations that have happier employees are X percent more creative, uh, Y percent more healthy and show for work more and um, Z percent more uh, profitable. OK, so those exact numbers, I'm not I'm not sure, um, but it's quite impressive and it's not just him. Uh, there's other people working on this. Uh, you might uh, know you might be familiar with somebody called Tony Shea, who was a CEO of a company called uh, Zappos, which eventually sold uh, to um, Amazon for more than a billion dollars. Uh, that's a billion with a B. Um, and uh, he started a company called Delivering Happiness. And uh, in, in their company, what they find as well is you can go to their website. It's called deliveringhappiness.com. Uh, you'll see uh, that they consult for a lot of impressive organizations. And across these organizations, they find a big positive effect of happiness on a variety of things, not just profits and productivity, but uh, team morale, um, uh, lower absenteeism, greater willingness to share tas what's called tacit knowledge. These are, this is not information that's there in some books or in some emails, but just people's kind of knowledge that is there in the back of their head. They're more willing to share that kind of a knowledge that's useful uh, with their uh, colleagues uh, and, and so on. OK, um, the, in the on the next slide again, I mean, I imagine the volume is not going to play, but that gentleman you see that is his name is Raj Sisodia and he's a professor at Babson College uh, in the US and he is now the author of, I don't know, I mean like seven or eight books. OK, very, very impressive gentleman. Uh, he's uh, co-authored with John Mackey, who was the founder and ex-CEO of uh, another kind of, you know, close to a billion dollar company, uh, Whole Foods, which has also been coincidentally acquired by uh, Amazon recently. Uh, and uh, John Mackey and he have a book together called uh, Conscious Capitalism that you might have heard of. And basically their idea is that uh, when a company is operating uh, in a conscious fashion, that is that it uh, really is genuinely authentically interested in enhancing the well-being of various stakeholders, but starting with employees. OK, these firms that are really focused on um, doing the right thing by their employees and not really merely focused on profits and um, productivity. Uh, those set of firms, Raj Sisodia and his co-authors, they call them firms of endearment, firms of endearment. And what they find is that these firms of endearment and there are about you know in the original uh, list there were about 28 of them and now there may be about 50 or 60 of them those firms of endearment outperform and have consistently outperformed the s p 500 by by not a you know low amount by by a thousand percent okay so that's really really impressive by a thousand percent they've been outperforming uh, the s p 500 so um it's not just a, a luxury. It's not just a good thing to have to have happy employees. It's actually the smart thing to have. It's uh, going to affect your bottom line in positive uh, ways. OK, so that's the uh, summary of these findings. And so what I want to do now is move on to um, if happiness is so important um, in the workplace, what are the determinants of it and how can we enhance it? OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about it on the next slide. Uh, you'll see that uh, I have this model that I call the Bamba model. Um, basically, it's uh, the five determinants of happiness in the workplace. And uh, let me start with the uh, first B, which is at the bottom. So on the next slide, you'll see that it says uh, basic needs. OK, those are the uh, that's the first uh, of the five. Uh, and basic needs are relatively easy to understand. Are people being paid enough to make ends meet? Um, in a, a physical sense, are people comfortable when they come into work uh, or are they feeling very uncomfortable? And, uh, you know, for example, the chairs and desks that are there in the office are not ergonomically designed. And so people uh, are, are in physical pain. So very, very basic things. OK, so that's with regard to the physical basic needs. And then you can talk about emotional basic needs. Um, how much do they uh, uh, like the people that they work with. OK, uh, so are they being treated fairly? Are they being uh, paid an, enough of an income? And is there a role clarity? Um, do people understand 
what it is that they were hired for, right? Uh, is there a transparency and, and a sense of fairness? So those set of things I call basic needs, okay? They can be physical basic needs, they can be mental basic needs, they can be emotional basic needs. And then the next one, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, it's uh, autonomy, okay? Um, so number two is autonomy, if you can pull that up. Um, just hit the next button, yeah, good. Uh, so autonomy, no, hang on, uh, you know, okay. Uh, so autonomy has to do with, um, how much of a sense of freedom and control you have in the organization? Do you feel micromanaged? Do you feel like you're being um, pressed down by uh, you're under the thumb of your of your boss, for example? Uh, perhaps the most important determinant of, or, or manifestation of autonomy is whether you have something that my colleague at UT Austin, his name is Ethan Burris, he, he calls it voice. So voice really is about feeling psychologically safe. Let's say you go into a meeting. OK, and your boss is presenting an idea and you have a doubt whether this idea is going to work. OK, and you genuinely feel that, you know, it's, it's probably not going to work because of a problem. How um, safe do you feel to put your hands up and voice this dissenting opinion? OK, that's that's called psychological safety. And uh, what he finds is that again and again in organizations that allow people to voice their opinions and uh, you know that that would only happen if people feel even the kind of lowest rung people feel the sense of psychological safety they uh, outperform um, the uh, organizations that don't have a lot of voice okay and voice is not just psychological safety it's also what's called psychological uh, impact in other words when i express my opinion is it not only heard but is it actually incorporated in decisions Sometimes you can say things and you feel a lot of psychological safety, but nothing happens, right? A month passes and you know everyone's forgotten what you said. And then you say it again and everybody says, yeah, that's a great idea, and then nothing happens. So you need to have both, okay? And there's lots of other things that go into autonomy, including having process freedom. Um, so do you are you given goals and a lot of clarity on what you're supposed to achieve, right? People want that clarity, but also given a lot of freedom in how you go about achieving it from where you achieve it, with whom you achieve it. You know, can you move around teams uh, relatively easily and so on? OK, so that's autonomy. Uh, the third, probably the um, determinant of happiness that people focus on the least um, in, in most organizations is mastery. Everybody has a desire to become increasingly good at what they do. OK, we all think of human nature as being or animal nature as being taking the easy way, way out. But if you have children, if you have observed children, you know that that's not true. You know, children, if you just ask them to relax on a, in a corner and just stay put, you know, just relax, don't do anything. We'll just feed you. You don't need to move out of your chair. They, they go nuts, right? We are learning machines. We love to explore. We love to uh, be stimulated. This is why we travel, right? If you think about it. Uh, now, unfortunately, when we come into work, many of us don't have that same zeal and enthusiasm and curiosity because we don't like what we do for work, okay? Which is a separate problem, okay? But everybody has a desire to become increasingly good at doing something, and I call this need the need for mastery. And um, in many of the organizations that I interviewed, this is the one uh, area in which uh, they can improve the most. Um, we don't really, at the year-end appraisals, for example, we don't really sit down with our direct reports and talk about, okay, what are the areas in which you wanted to improve? And let's see if we are providing you opportunities for you to improve in those areas, okay? In fact, in a lot of organizations, um, most of the employees don't even know what set of skills they want to acquire over their lifetime, okay? Uh, which might be a failing of the educational institutions as well, that uh, people are not as self-aware as we would like um, it to be for them to be able to identify where they want to progress towards mastery, the domains in which they want to do it, and then you know actually seek out those opportunities. And firms, for their part, don't really um, spend a lot of time talking about this. Um, the fourth determinant is uh, belonging, which is the sense of connection that you have with your coworkers, and it turns out to be super important even in organizational contexts. Um, for example, if you uh, work in an organization where you have your best friends working for you, uh, your chances of quitting that organization in the next year are actually uh, half, right? So that's a significant drop in your chances of quitting an organization if your best friend also works for the same organization. So we are highly social as a species, and we obviously know this, you know, uh, love mo movies, romance movies, for example, and books on romance are the top selling genre and category, especially maybe in Bollywood, right? 99% of the movies are about love. Um, but we, it also turns out that we seek the sense of belonging and connection in our workplace as well, okay? Uh, um, Gallup, which has done a lot of work on job satisfaction over the past 40 years, their top line finding is this, 
Okay, they've done this work over 140 countries over 40 years. And if you ask them, what is your top line finding? The top line finding is people don't leave organizations. People leave people, right? People leave people. If you don't get along with people, you don't get along with your boss in particular. That's the single biggest determinant for why you're likely to quit. OK, the last one uh, in the Bamba model, right, BA, MBA, is abundance culture, a culture of abundance orientation where people have each other's backs. People feel that they come to work in uh, what might be a second family for them. And um, they don't uh, ideally they don't feel jealous or insecure uh, when their colleague uh, does something really well and are promoted and get a pay raise. Uh, they in fact feel happy for them. OK. Um, so that's an abundance oriented culture. If you contrast that with a scarcity oriented culture and scarcity oriented culture, everyone's looking uh, after themselves, right? They're really interested in very self-centered goals. And um, so it's a dog eat dog world in a scarcity oriented culture. Everyone's trying to pull other people down in order to advance themselves. Obviously within a firm, the firm can only be as strong as the bond between people is right and if everyone's kind of like already thinking of everyone else's competition and they're cutting each other down as an organization you're not going to grow okay you need an organization that in which people are cohesive people are supportive people are um, sharing uh, knowledge and information with each other supporting each other rather than pulling each other down OK, you want to compete with other organizations, OK, but not within an organization and an abundance cultured uh, organization promotes that sense of cooperation and so therefore is uh, likely to be more profitable and productive because people in that culture are, are happier. OK, so that's in a nutshell the Bamba model. And um, as Rajiv mentioned, I have a course out which has uh, now actually it's, it's, you know, he said uh, quarter million. That's quite impressive um, and not to kind of pat myself on the back or anything. I mean, this has got to do uh, really at some level nothing to do with me. It's just that happiness as a topic is hugely uh, attractive to a lot of people around the world and it's got more than 325,000 students now that course and then there's another course which was on for about uh, six months. It has uh, 5,000 students and we are going to relaunch the course hopefully by July 1st and that one is focused specifically on this Bamba model and employee happiness and I'm happy to share the link with that uh, to that course a little bit later. Um, but if you're interested in digging deeper, in, uh, deeper into the topic, uh, you might want to consider taking that course. OK, so um, with that, uh, I'm going to just spend maybe a couple of minutes on the uh, simulation. We are already at 830, um, so uh, hopefully this will go fast. And what I want to do is um, um, uh, ask you a couple of questions. OK, and, and while um, Hardik is pulling up that PowerPoint on the screen, let me just very quickly tell you that the purpose of the simulation overall is to um, help people understand, help leaders understand what uh, would a happiness maximizing leader do? What's the um, best thing to do given a situation for enhancing the happiness of the organization as a whole? And um, in, in many of these uh, simulation scenarios, we have a particular person who is not feeling as happy as would be desirable and they're uh, suffering. Their happiness is suffering for a particular reason. So what's the best strategy? What's the best set of action items? You know, what's the best action you can take in order to address that problem? OK, so I'm going to walk you through. Um, actually, you know, I'm going to allow you give you the opportunity to um, kind of make such a selection uh, among options yourself, given a particular scenario and Obviously, you know, we don't have the time to kind of describe the scenario in great detail, uh, which would happen in the actual simulation. But here I just want to give you a very, very quick uh, idea of how the simulation might work. OK, so uh, let's look at scenario one. OK, so let's say this is the problem, right? This is the challenge that you're facing. This is lowering the happiness. You realize that your team is underperforming. Suddenly profits and sales are down. All right. Um, and how would you um, address this problem? OK, and there are four different options here. You can see on your screen. Uh, by the way, on my screen, I'm not able to see the bottom option for some reason uh, because I think that the control panel is hiding it. Hopefully it's not an issue for other people. So OK, you can read the four options yourself. And uh, what I want you guys to do is um, you'll see that there is a link to a poll and I want you to uh, select one of these options in that poll and then we will share with you the results of that poll and I'll tell you a little bit about what some of the research says on what's the best way to address this particular situation. So Hardik, if you can kind of tell me when the poll results are in uh, and what they are, hopefully there's a way to share it on the screen, uh, then I'll be able to walk people through uh, what they selected and whether that was the good choice to make 
and what might be uh, a bad choice to make. Sure, Professor. So I'll be. Uh, so I have texted the link wherein you can take the poll and take a survey on that. I think in the interest of time, it might be best to go back to that slide, and I'll just kind of walk people through, uh, you know, what some of the research says on what might be the best option and what might not be so good. So this is the other slide deck. OK, so uh, one thing that you know some of you might think might be a good option is to um, have an employee of the month award that might incentivize people to work harder. But actually what the research finds is that that's not a very good option, particularly in the long run. And there's a couple of reasons for it. One of the reasons is that you know when you have an employee of the month type award uh, that's tethered to the performance, um, then you have typically you know one winner, maybe two when they're sharing it, but then if it's 100, person company, you have 99, 98 losers right every month. And that's not a very good uh, feeling to have. You know, people are going to get jealous. It's going to uh, actually foster a kind of scarcity oriented culture rather than an abundance oriented culture. Also, uh, oftentimes it's not very clear what the metrics are, uh, as I'm sure even in an organization in which you seem to have relatively objective yardstick, like number of papers published right uh, as a as a um, you know, researcher, um, faculty member, of a research um, oriented organization, it, there is still ambiguity. You know, uh, should some publications count for more because they are in in uh, better uh, outlets? OK, uh, things like that. So what happens is there is a tendency for uh, politics to come into the picture. OK, when you have these kind of awards. Also, the person who's won the award one month, they might probably expect that next month I'm not going to win this. OK, because I've already won it. They're not going to give it to me twice. And so they're going to take the foot off the pedal a little bit, you know, and, and slack off. Right. So lots of reasons why um, this is not a very good idea, it turns out in the long run, especially. OK, um, also increasing the bonus uh, is not a good idea for kind of similar reasons that I won't get into in the interest of time. Uh, I think option C and option D are probably the best. Maybe option C, start out with option C, um, have, make it democratic, not just a, a small kind of private group of people talking about uh, this particular problem, but uh, calling everybody and it might well turn out that there's really nothing to be done. OK, no, nothing to be fixed because there's no problem. Uh, it's just a seasonal change. You know, right now, for example, is a great example, right? That due to the pandemic, um, sales are down. OK, nothing to do with the teams underperforming. Uh, it's just that uh, or, or, you know, slacking off. It's just that they don't seem to be performing as well because of things that are completely out of your control. OK, and that might lead you to ideas on what it is that we can do. OK, so we need to survive. We need to be able to pay everyone their salaries. We need to have the cash flows coming in. So what can we do in this situation? And this might be one of those cases where because you have a challenge, because you have a constraint, you're able to come up with creative new ways of uh, acquiring new businesses and, 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 and so on. OK, um, so that that leads to uh, option D. OK, so I'm going to um, actually stop here and not show you scenario two um, because we've kind of lost some time uh, and I do want to entertain questions and I already know that there's one or two um, on the panel and Rajiv has a few questions which are very interesting as well and we only have about 25 minutes OK, or 23 minutes right now. So why don't I turn it over to you Rajiv and then uh, we can uh, tackle the questions and go from there. Not able to hear you, not able to hear you. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, sharing the framework. Super insightful and mm -hmm. uh, sharing the scenario as well. So uh, I think there's a question from Dalia Farooq on uh, the chat window uh, and I had one which was very similar as well. Any ideas how to motivate or make employees happier in such a crisis environment? And I think the um, the, the causal link that exists between the sense of control that we'd like over our life, um, right? With the loss of control, we seem to experience anxiety and when there is anxiety, happiness goes uh, outside the window. So uh, in the current context, you know, when we are all under lockdown and COVID hit and we don't know uh, what future has in store, we, there's a sen sense of loss of control. So in this uh, situation, what would your recommendation be uh, in terms of re regaining that resilience, uh, getting more anxiety and getting to a happier state? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I think that the loss of control or loss of autonomy is a big reason for the lower happiness uh, right now and higher levels of stress and uh, presumably lower levels of productivity because of that. And so the more as a leader you can give people a sense of control and 
um, increase their sense of autonomy, the more happy they're going to be. OK, and how can you do it? I think in firms that can afford it uh, to reassure people that they're not going to be fired. Maybe everyone's going to have to take a bit of a pay cut. Maybe those big bonuses are not going to happen this time. Um, and uh, so we'll all get uh, through this together one way or the other. OK, that reassurance, I think, is the single biggest thing that you can provide to employees to make them feel less stressed and more happy. Uh, the second thing that I've discovered is that in, in times of anxiety and loss of control, um, you, what people need is a lot of information. OK, maybe as a leader, you, could, you should even err on the side of providing too many opportunities for them to have an informal, uh, op, uh, you know, optional um, Zoom meeting, for example. OK, uh, set one up every week, perhaps maybe more than that if needed. But at least one a week where you say that, OK, for one hours, two hours, I'm just going to take questions. I'm going to just going to answer questions. That's all. OK, come in at uh, Fridays at 1, 1 p.m. and 1 to 3 p.m. We're going to do this. OK, that's another thing. I think that people in, the, in this, you know, we talk about autonomy uh, in the context of autonomy voice, right? Psychological safety. Um, I think that's super important in this context. So allow people to come up with ideas and opinions and sift through those opinions and identify the ones that are probably the best. Uh, and a creative will be able to bring in more business, lower costs in, in whatever way, you know, help out and uh, then take action on those ideas, right? Uh, so psychological safety is not just feeling safe, but also um, knowing that your ideas have impact. And so doing that, I think uh, would be very, very important. A um, couple of things that I'll add to this. One is that I think that, um, you know, we assume that uh, people are uh, going to get enough uh, kind of social contact uh, on their own in their private lives. And, and as co-workers, we don't need to do much. Uh, but a lot of us are actually living in a kind of a situation where we're maybe not married or uh, far away from family. Uh, so we're not getting the same level of social contact with other people uh, that we used to get before. And so addressing it might be another way in which to do this. So apart from this optional meetings where you answer questions, if you can have maybe, you know, Saturday evening happy hours, again, optional. So you're not forcing people to join, but, you know, you, everybody brings their own drink and um, hangs out. OK, and I'm sure that some of the coworkers are doing it anyway on their own, but to kind of like sponsor it as an organization might be another thing to do, particularly for leaders, because people look up to leaders and, and feel a little bit of a distance. Uh, of the hierarchy, and so they may not proactively approach the leaders and say, hey, we'd like to hang out with you. Um, but if you can do that, you're going to show a more personable side, uh, a more kind of like, you know, uh, emotional side, uh, supportive side, uh, informal side. And I think that's very, very important too, okay, in this context. So those are the set of things that I have, and I'm happy to kind of dig deeper to um, address any specific case by case things that you might have going on in your particular organization. Okay, so I, I hope that helps, Rajiv. Again, can't hear you. Sorry. More more questions on the uh, chat window. So while uh, more questions are popping up, uh, the next one from my end is I'm really intrigued by this abundance culture uh, concept that you spoke about, uh, because for the longest time we, we've seen the org chart, which is in the form of a pyramid. As you go higher in the organization, it's built for scarcity. It is built for competition. Only the, the fittest survives. Uh, right, and uh, we also know the bell curve, which uh, is brutal about who gets it, who doesn't get it. Uh, so all that, you know, sets up a sense of competition by default at a system level, right? Um, and you're talking about um, abundance culture. Um, so what are some systemic changes that uh, will have to be made? Uh, while leaders may want to build an abundance culture, but there are certain things in the system that, that may not permit it. From your experience, what are some things that organizations can do uh, to establish that? from a system standpoint. Yeah, so uh, look, you know, the reality is that organizations for the most part, especially in the business world, are going to be pyramidical in, in nature, right? I mean, there's fewer places at the top. Uh, now, you know, there are some exciting alternatives that are coming up, uh, like self-organizing or, you know, organizations, self-managing organizations and stuff like that, that have seemed to have a much flatter hierarchy that might be interesting to look into for those who are interested in that. Uh, the thing is that uh, I'm not arguing that, uh, you know, you can completely get rid of the scarcity orientation because some um, things are in place for uh, the scarcity orientation to be uh, fostered, right? I mean, like you mentioned, there's only uh, so many places at the top, there's more places at the bottom. So the idea is that, uh, especially in those kind of setups, right, where there's, it's, it's a particularly narrow pyramid, uh, you need to counter that through doing things 
um, culturally through processes and other things that you do in the organization uh, that help foster a sense of belonging, help foster a sense of uh, family orientation, if you will, all the hallmarks of a abundance oriented organization. Okay, so it really boils down to doing specific things at a micro level that, uh, you know, that that enable people or, or uh, get people to believe that they believe they're working in an organization that's more abundance oriented. So let me talk about some specific things. There are some organizations in which there's a lot of um, uh, salary gap or, or wage gap, you know, so the CEO ends up earning, let's say, multiple hundred times that of the average worker. OK, that is not going to promote an abundance orientation in the United States, for example, between the 1980s and now the uh, this this gap has grown uh, many, many, many times. OK, from about 30 or, or 40 in the, the 80s to about uh, 300 or 400 now. OK, so uh, that is not going to be very good. So if you have um, CEOs occupying a corner office with great 360 degree views of uh, the town and everyone else is in a little cubicle, that's not going to promote an abundance uh, culture. OK, if the uh, CEO, regardless of what time they get in, you know, the, the um, uh, top management team leaders, they get to have plum parking spots and everybody else has, you know, parking spots somewhere else. That's not going to promote an abundance culture. OK, um, if they have uh, better superior bathrooms and restrooms and everyone else has to kind of use uh, another kind of restroom, that's not going. So it's like little things like that. If you have the employee of the month award, that's not going to promote an abundance oriented culture. So while the reality is only so many people can get promoted, right? Um, is it also true that by and large, everybody's taking care, uh, you know, needs are getting um, taken care of? And there is an attempt at promoting equality. So if you look at WD-40 and company, right, one of the best companies to work for, the CEO has the same size office as the rest of the people. OK, 10 by 12. He says, I don't need a bigger office. Why do I need it? It's not as if like I'm actually physically kind of like needing more space. You know, it's the intellectual work that I do. I try to lead them. Uh, so he doesn't need a physically uh, bigger uh, office. And uh, likewise, everyone gets, you know, if you want a better parking spot, you better come in early is what he says. OK, uh, also you can kind of hire the right kind of people based off of values. OK, Southwest Airlines, for example, OK, very, very keen on hiring people who have an they don't call it abundance oriented orientation, but hiring people that uh, put people and their emotions and their needs on top first before uh, skills or, or even profits. OK, so uh, I actually kind of talked to Cheryl Huey, who was um, who is still uh, the kind of um, a VP for people and, and culture at uh, Southwest. They actually have a position like that, uh, VP for culture. And uh, I, I put her in a spot. I asked her, OK, supposing you're interviewing two people, OK, for a pilot position, this is Southwest Airlines, right? Um, and one of them is much more skilled, has a lot more experience under his belt. And the other person, uh, she's not that skilled, OK, but is, is more uh, aligned with your culture. Who would you select? She said she acknowledged this would be a tough call to make, but 100 times out of 100, we'd go with the latter person, even though it's a tough call to make because we feel that skills can be learned, people can be coached, but culture is something, uh, values are something that people come, uh, and that too can be coached and maybe can be learned, but it's much more difficult to move people on that. So it's the little things, and again, if you take my course, you know, there's a lot of ideas that we give. For example, you know, there are companies in which gossiping is not permitted. OK, uh, or at least, you know, uh, is, is they, they try and um, make it such that, you know, if you gossip, you're going to not get as, as much of a raise. OK, uh, and the, the way that they appraise it is by uh, asking people at the year end uh, appraisal time uh, to what extent that this, does this person engage in gossiping and, and uh, causing bad blood. OK, um, so little things like that that you can do in order to encourage an abundance orientation in an organization. Awesome. Um, here's. A question um, that I, 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 I'm sure you've you've been asked this a million times. So you you are identified with this whole idea of happiness, um, happy smarts, and and so on. So, so are you always under pressure to be happy? <laughs> um, people expect you to be happy because you seem to have cracked the code. Is, is that true? Yeah. So uh, I do think that people uh, at some level expect me to be happy, and and uh, maybe they put some pressure on me like that. Uh, but honestly, you know, I don't take that pressure. Um, I, I I have a definition of happiness that is uh, broader than what people might think. OK, uh, I think that people tend to associate happiness with perhaps pleasure and with uh, ha ha ha, you know, all the time and 
never being serious or, or never getting angry or guilty or whatever, you know, uh, I think that uh, happiness at some level, you know, is um, a state in which um, you'd rather not be somewhere else doing something else. You'd rather not be somewhere else doing something else. So right now, if I feel angry and I feel that I'm justified in being angry and, um, you know, uh, then I'm happy being angry uh, at some level. OK, um, now the truth is that oftentimes uh, if you dig deeper into the topic, you know, if you're interested in happiness, you really have to get deep into your own psychology and be self-aware and all that. It turns out that oftentimes the anger is unjustified. You know, it's just a miscommunication or you have a big ego or you know, uh, you're engaging in some kind of self-serving bias where you feel that you deserve more than other people do or whatever, right? And you're not as forgiving and you might have done the same mistake that that person did that hurt you had you been in their shoes and so on. So uh, the truth is that um, if you're an authentic seeker of happiness, you will spend less and less time in negative emotions, I feel. And, you know, so I just focus on that. You know, I just focus on putting in place a bunch of habits that I know reliably make me feel the set of emotions that I want uh, to experience that are productive, that are happy emotions, that are mostly positive. Doesn't mean I don't feel negative, uh, but I really don't take a lot of that pressure. Okay. And I also kind of at some level, Rajiv, you know, I have to acknowledge this is that I, I lucked out on the happiness lottery. You know, when you look at the research, they say at least, you know, 50% of your happiness is genetic. And yep. um, so I, I was born with happy genes, you know, relatively happy genes, not like ecstatic genes, <laughs> uh, but relatively happy genes, maybe a 7, 7.5 on a 10 point scale. So I feel very blessed. I feel very grateful. Um, and uh, yeah, so you could say that there is some some pressure that people try to put on me, but I, I really try not to take that pressure. Awesome. So um, a question from Sunita Sinha. Uh, how do you integrate this model of happiness, the Bamba model into the performance framework in organizations? So they have the nine grid model where happiness doesn't feature in there. There is potential and performance. There are only two dimensions to it. So how do you incorporate happiness into it? Yeah, so I think of happiness as a determinant. It comes before. So if in your mind's eye, you can kind of like visualize an image where uh, profits and productivity come at the far right end. Um, and uh, most firms are obviously interested in that. That's called the bottom line, right? Uh, so that's it, you know, that's the last stop in other words. So uh, the idea is what can you do to increase uh, performance and profits if you want to look at it purely strategically, not morally, ethically, etc. Um, the question is what can you do? And of course, firms are interested in doing those things that en um, enhance profits and productivity. And for a very, very long time, we've been talking about engagement, right? Um, and that's a big buzzword. And we know that people are more engaged, are more profitable and productive. Um, and so the idea is, OK, is engagement a good thing OK, uh, to look at? And you could argue it is. But if you talk to somebody like Nick Marks, who runs this uh, organization called Friday Pulse uh, out of UK, I interviewed him a couple of weeks back. He thinks that engagement is uh, is not the right metric because engagement is just another word for uh, how productive you are. Okay, if you as an employee know that there's an engagement survey coming, at some level subconsciously or sometimes consciously you're aware that what the survey is about is how productive have I been? How much of a good cog in the wheel have I been for the organization? Okay, if you get a happiness survey on the other hand, chances are that you're going to say, hey, you know, this organization is truly interested in me and my, you know, well-being rather than how productive I am. And so uh, it's a better measure to use. And what we're arguing is that in that uh, thing that I asked you to imagine, flowchart, if you will, or the right end is profits and productivity, and engagement might be a good thing, arguable whether it's a good thing to measure. We think happiness is um, is really a uh, much better uh, thing to prioritize and measure because people feel good when you tell them I'm interested in your happiness, okay? Um, it's also broader, you know, if you for you to be happy, uh, not only should you have a good time at work, you need to uh, be outside of work too, you know, have a good time and be healthy, for example. And so the organization might be interested in, okay, can we uh, sign you up for a gym membership, for example, right? Can we sponsor that? Or maybe see if we can uh, pay uh, extra for a vacation you want to take, or um, maybe kind of uh, look at some hobbies that you want to pursue and, and maybe pay for it. Because all of those in the end, if it makes you happier, it's going to result in higher engagement, higher satisfaction, higher morale, and then uh, affect your uh, productivity and profits as well. So I really don't think that it's part of that, you know, nine, I, I don't know of that particular model, by the way, okay, uh, performance versus potential, but it's not part of that, but it leads to that, if that makes sense. Got it, got it. 
So Raksha has an interesting question. Uh, does less reward lead to more happiness at work? I think there are some studies around this where incentives versus no incentives or intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Can you speak about that? Does less reward lead to more happiness? Yeah, I, I think it's not the question of less reward versus uh, more reward. It's a question of what type of reward. I, I do think that there is a big difference between intrinsic and extrinsic rewards. Uh, the more you're given extrinsic rewards, the more you're praised uh, in a kind of a monetary fashion, for example, right? Uh, or in a fashion that makes you um, acquire status, uh, etc. What might we call extrinsic things? Um, uh, the more you attribute your desire to work to those extrinsic rewards over the long term. Okay, so you might start out with somebody, an employee who really truly is very, very interested, let's say with Nolscape in, in, in doing simulations, right? They're really into that and they love it. And then you start kind of paying them uh, bonuses for doing a good job. Uh, over a period of uh, X number of years, they're going to now think that the reason why they're doing the job is to get the bonus and the money and not because they're intrinsically motivated. You actually kill intrinsic motivation through providing them extrinsic rewards. A much better thing to do would be to assign them to particular projects in which they seem to be even more intrinsically motivated or assign them to a team with which they get along really well personality wise, okay? Or sign them up for conferences or uh, give them subscription to libraries or books or online courses that build those uh, set of interests and skills rather than you know just hand them money okay uh, or put them on a pedestal and and show, you know tell them that they are the most superior performer and, and they get to put a big plaque on their office that tells them that they are the the best employee of the month so it's it's not rewards per se it's what type of rewards they are got it then that's great so i've heard you speak um, at various forums and webinars you speak about how you can probably own your own happiness your internal state but if you mm -hmm. want to make mm -hmm. others happy Right, you can take the horse to the pond, so to speak, but uh, you can't really make others happy, right? So that makes the role of a leader a little bit challenging because I can take care of my own internal state, but how do I really make others happy? What are the, let's say, the top three things in today's context? What are the top three things that one can do? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that the first thing is uh, that you know you you you're careful in hiring, right? Uh, we are highly social as a species. And um, that means that we get along best with the people with whom our values are aligned, not our interests. OK, you can have different interests. One person might be really interested in tennis. Another person might be interested in karate. Uh, you know, one might be, uh, let's say, um, interested in religion. Another person might be completely atheistic. OK, uh, actually, religion is probably a, not such a good example because it taps into values a little bit. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, do you have a bunch of people who are aligned in terms of values? and we can have a long conversation about exactly what values are, but they lie at the deepest level, uh, you know, your, your set of core beliefs about the world, about who you are and who, what other people are. You know, some people are more trusting of other people, other people less trusting and so on, those set of things. Okay, it's very, very important to hire people who are aligned in values because we tend to get along best with people who are aligned in terms of values, okay? And then once you hire people, then there's a bunch of things that you can do um, within that organize, you know, when they're there in the organization in terms of the processes, I already talked uh, about a few of them, right? Like, for example, try and reduce the salary gap, um, you know, make it a more flat, more equal. You know, at a country level, we talked about Gini index, which uh, reflects the inequality, income inequality. So you try to, you want to try and reduce that, okay? Um, and then also, you know, when, when people want to leave, um, you do it in a way that's uh, considerate, that's compassionate. OK, those set of things that you can do. Uh, ultimately, of course, you know, uh, it is true that people can have the biggest impact on their own happiness and other people can't do as much for your happiness as you can do for yourself. So as a leader, if you can kind of expose them to a variety of tools that they can pick, you know, not force them because people don't like being forced. You know, they want their autonomy. But if you tell them that, look, hey, you know, you have all kinds of opportunities in this firm in order to increase your own happiness, okay? Um, and there's a variety of ways to do it. You know, leading a healthy lifestyle is very, very important. It, it tackles many of the basic needs, giving them a sense of this voice, psychological safety, giving them a lot of goal clarity, but at the same time, process freedom, enabling them to identify where they want to be a master and then helping them progress towards mastery in those domains, fostering a sense of belonging within the organization and you know having a sense of abundance culture right um, so all of these things you can do in order to kind of enable them to uh, for themselves take a set of actions that are going to make them happy happier person okay so that's we've so. got a couple of minutes uh, i just want to make sure that we do justice to a bunch of questions that have come in 
Uh, maybe I'll pick one last, uh, which I think uh, personally, you know, we all have a challenge with. How difficult is it to be happy? Uh, does it require a lot of discipline? Since it requires habit formation, you're really talk talking about some tactics. You're really hacking into your mind to stay on the positive side. So from your experience and research, how difficult is it to be happy? Um, it, it is probably the loftiest goal there is, right? I mean, it's for no, like, you know, um, trivial reason that the some of the people that we look up to as the best philosophers, the the most inspiring people that we look up to, you know, from the Buddha to Aristotle to Jesus and so on, um, are people who are very, very interested in the topic. OK, and, and it's one of the loftiest goals. And the misconception is often that, you know, uh, I realize that I have to work really hard to get a, a great body, for example, or to become an athlete or to get this plum job, um, etc. And to get a raise and to get a good degree and save enough for retirement and so on. We realize that that's going to take a lot of discipline and hard work and we're willing to do it. But somehow with happiness, we just feel that it, it just will land in my lap. You know, I don't need to think much about it. It's just going to happen now. Happiness is also complex because the more you pursue it and chase it directly, it actually reduces your happiness. OK, so that doesn't mean happiness is not important. It's like love. You know, love is also very, very important. We understand that. But chasing the object of our love is probably going to be counterproductive, right? They're not going to like us as much if we constantly are badgering them. So the idea is to prioritize it, but not pursue it. And there are ways to prioritize it uh, that have been shown. You know, we live in very lucky times now because we have a lot of research on this topic on happiness. And so we know a certain set of things uniformly across many, many, many people are likely to improve your happiness. And so you can just try those first, you know, not to say that they're guaranteed to improve your happiness. So leading a healthy lifestyle, for example, uh, sleeping, you know, seven hours every night, uh, things like that are going to most likely improve your happiness. Being grateful, practicing gratefulness is going to huge, you know, impact on happiness. OK, being kind to other people, um, finding something that you're truly deeply interested in and spending time becoming increasingly good at it, nurturing a few very, very important close friendships, including the one with your spouse, you know, with whom you're going to live hopefully the rest of your life. Those kinds of things, you know, it's not it's not a no brainer but it is going to take a lot of discipline. OK, there's no getting around it. Any goal, any goal that's worthwhile is going to take a lot of discipline uh, and that includes happiness. And that might seem like a bit of a kind of a paradoxical thing that for me to be happy, I felt that I just wanted to relax and not have to work hard and not think you know, deeply about it and so on. And here you're telling me that even this goal is going to take that takes the happiness out of it. OK, uh, I think that at one level, you know, you can you can argue that that's a justified point of view to have. But uh, really, I mean, you know, uh, at another level, it's not. I mean, it's like any other goal. Uh, it is going to take that hard work. The good thing about it is that even small things might have a big impact. You know, I call these low hanging fruit. OK, if you can just tackle a few low hanging fruit and get them, get to implement them in your life. OK, uh, after that, I think that just the confidence you get that, oh, yeah, that did increase my happiness levels, right? So I'll give you a very quick example. Just identify three things in your life that reliably make you happy, okay? Reliably make you happy. And three things that reliably bring you down, okay? Um, and so long as you're not crossing some ethical boundaries or, you know, you're not overly focused on short-term versus long-term happiness, if you do these things, right? For example, for me, you know, watching a comedy show, um, almost, almost always makes me happy. OK, um, going for a run, even though in the moment it's a little bit difficult. Uh, almost, I've never gone for a run and not felt happy after it or happier or more centered after it than I have before it. OK, uh, so little things like that. OK, if you can just identify a few things in your life that reliably make you happy, just do those things. All right. Getting a good night's sleep, you know, be disciplined about it. Go to sleep at the same time every day. Wake up at the same time every day. You'll quickly within a week fall into that routine. And don't compromise on it, you know, because it's going to put you in such a much better mood the next day. You're going to be 100 percent there as opposed to only being 50 percent there. So little things like that. If you start doing it, then you gain confidence and and uh, you become a happier person. And then, you know, it becomes kind of like it's not hard. What is the thing that there's a quote, right? If uh, uh, going to work is like a vacation, then you're not really working anymore, right? That kind of a thing. So it becomes like that. Um, so it's although it takes discipline, it seems that you can easily uh, get that discipline into your life. I hope that answered the question. Yes, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so we've got a few more questions, but I think you've answered um, uh, these questions already. Zahir, he uh, spoke about intrinsic motivation. Uh, Vijay Sarthi from Ashok Leyland, um, the ability to manage stress and emotions. Uh, right, that's key to uh, happiness as well. So I think we've pretty much done justice to most of the questions that have come our way. 
So um, thank you so much, Professor Raj, for spending this hour with us. Uh, it's been super insightful and inspiring. I'm going to uh, think about these three happy um, things that make me happy, being intentional about it, being mindful about it, because otherwise we are just accidentally happy. Something comes right. up and we are happy. Uh, so how can we turn that accidental happiness to something more that's in our control, something that we can manufacture for ourselves? So thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, please do um, uh, check out this course on uh, happier employees and ROI on edX. Um, so amazingly useful course and uh, check out uh, Professor's book as well. And uh, watch out for the simulation that's coming out from Nullscape on uh, happiness. Um, so you, you're going to enjoy that. So on that note, uh, thank you so much once again, Professor Raj. And to all of you who have signed in and have asked some interesting questions, uh, I appreciate your time and thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.